So uh, my name is Lisa Blaschka, and uh, I am a, uh, um, the chair of the board of the Eden Fellows, and I'm here today with uh, Steve Wheeler, who is um, a uh, Eden Senior Fellow and has been with Eden since 1996. Uh, he's a learning innovations consultant and former associate professor of learning uh, technologies at Plymouth Institute of Education, where he chaired the Learning F Futures Group and led the computing and science education teams. He continues to research into technology-supported learning and distance education with a special emphasis on pedagogy underlying the use of social media and Web 2.0 technologies. He's also research interests in mobile learning and cyber cultures. He's given numerous, numerous keynotes, both within Eden and outside of Eden, at numerous, uh, in numerous countries, numerous organizations, uh, has written over 150 scholarly articles. Uh, and if you haven't already, please be sure to check out his blog, Learning with Ease. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about uh, some of the challenges that we face right now in uh, really being face to face, but as a dis in at a distance. How do we build learning communities online when we're faced with with this pandemic, with a with a global crisis? Uh, and so um, I'm going to hand it over to Steve so that he can start with his presentation. Uh, welcome to everyone, and once again, just to re uh, to reiterate, please put your questions and answers into the Q and A box or if you're in YouTube in the chat. Um, here in Zoom, please uh, do not put your questions in the chat, but put it in the Q&A box. So, Steve, handing it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. I um, hope you can um, hear me OK. Is that all right? And I uh, hope you can see my slides as well, which I'm going to put up onto the screen for you now. Um, I hope you can see those too. Um, if you can't, then stop me and <laughs> we'll... We'll make sure that the technology works. But um, it's lovely to be with you all, and it's lovely to see you here from, well, here, virtually wherever it is, from all over the world. And indeed, this is what I would call a global learning community. And I think this is something we're going to have to get used to for a while, um, if not forever, because I think um, this is the new normal. And um, I hope you're feeling safe and, and um, that you're keeping healthy and that um, this seminar will have something uh, for everyone. Um, I'm gonna try and take a few risks today, and as I go through these slides, you'll see why I say that, is because I'm, I'm going to try and dabble in some theories and some um, ideas which not everybody finds um, uh, useful, or, 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 or you know, sometimes people might find them challenging. But um, the idea behind this is that we are face-to-face -face at a distance, and I got that idea, that kind of, um, that phrase from an old mentor of mine, um, a man called Ray Winders, who was who uh, was my mentor back in the 90s when I first entered into the world of distance education. And uh, I was at Plymouth University at the time as a researcher, and he coined this phrase face to face, but at a distance. And I thought, wow, that's a, a great idea. Steve, from, could, um, we're not seeing your slides. Could you please share, your, share your screen? I'll let you know Let's if we see the see slides. It. Let's just see if I can. Um, Bring them up onto the screen for you. And so we did test this beforehand, so we this does did. work. <laughs> there, we are, there we are. There we are. So Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Can you see it now? I hope that's better. <clears throat> so um let, let me just quote now from from, from this um this guy here. Um from this guy, Peter Drucker. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. Um, the danger is not so much in the turbulence, it's in, in thinking in, 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 in past ways, um, using yesterday's logic, as he says. And I want to hark back to what uh, Alan Tate said in the last seminar, the last webinar, which is where he was talking about um, the idea of the horseless carriage, you know, what became known as the, the car, um, which was built originally on the design of the old horse-drawn carriages. And our danger, as, as he said, is, is to keep using old logic and to keep thinking in old ways about new problems. We have a huge global emergency right now, and we need to start thinking in new ways. <clears throat> and um, this idea of reverse, reverse assumption theory, this guy called Matthew Said, he came up with this, this book called Rebel Ideas. And then he talks about taking the assumption and reversing what we think about that particular idea. So let's take um, a taxi firm, for instance. Could we take a taxi firm and say, okay, that taxi firm has no cars whatsoever? 
Well, of course we can, because it's now called Uber. We could do the same with, um, with I don't know, with uh, bed and breakfast, you know, hotels, um, or, or, you know, they've got no rooms. Um, and that would be Airbnb, of course. And um, he says the same about education. What if, what if we took education and said, OK, education is not about pushing knowledge anymore. It's about something else. And um, this is the kind of reverse assumption idea that, that I, I, I kind of quite like because it, it appeals to the rebellious nature in me. And, and I think all of us have that in us somewhere. All of us have this kind of um, what we call the, um, the, the positive deviant in us, the idea that we want to do something good, but we don't want to do it in the way that everyone is telling us we should. So let's take that idea and run with it if we can. And um, let's take the idea of blended learning to start with because – that seems to be something that's been around for a long time and everyone accepts blended learning as, a, as a, an exotic mix between being present in the same room and being remote, so face-to-face -face or at a distance. And um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a binary. You're either in the same place or you're not, but you're using technology to mediate that community of learning. But let's take some other types of blended learning now, which may be not considered as blended learning, but in fact, when you look at it, they actually are. Because often we switch between synchronous and asynchronous, live and recorded types of, um, of education uh, online. And we also switch between teacher-led and student-led. And both of those have a validity, um, but they're, they're different in different contexts. They have different outcomes, different challenges, different... Um, contexts around them and another one is the tethered um, against the, the mobile the, the kind of the the switch between the two and all of these I would consider to be blended learning but if you look on the left hand side I would call those very much a traditional mode you can do those very much without any technology mediation whereas the ones on the right they are, they are much more progressive you need the technology then to actually make them happen so then you become completely reliant on that technology or as I said recently, when I was talking to a group of teachers who have had to go onto this online pivot and suddenly become involved in teaching completely at a distance, I said to them, that's okay as long as you're, you, know, you realize you're relying on your home Wi-Fi, the bandwidth of the hub, and a three-year-old laptop, which is often the case. You know, if, if that goes, then everyone suddenly becomes blind and deaf, don't they? Um, all of our students are just cut out of the process, so we've got to be careful um, about what we're talking about when we talk about blended learning. What is our assumption about blended learning? And I'm going to move on from there and um, throw you another idea. This is um, uh, my old friend Michael Moore, who I've known for many, many years, he talks about transactional distance. He talks about the idea that um, there's a balance between dialogue and structure. If we put too much structure into our, um, into our uh, kind of uh, online learning experiences, then it drives down the potential for personalized learning, it drives down student autonomy, and it drives up this idea of having a psychological gap, what he calls the transactional distance. If on the other hand, you push structure down and push dialogue up, then the reverse happens. You get less transactional distance, you get less problems for students feeling that they're isolated. And there's some ideas behind this. I, I did some research on this back in um, the early 2000s on um, dialogue itself as part of the theory. And I, just, I, I realized from my data, and Michael agreed with this, that there are in fact two aspects of dialogue at least. One is social presence, the other one's immediacy. And I'm going to explore those with you in a second. Another idea is the idea of student autonomy, which Michael himself talked about. And there's a, a third idea about uh, motivation that comes into this, and Maslow's a classic case of that. There's another one here, the three types of interaction, which more um, Kearsley talked about. And a fourth one around Carl Rogers' idea of student-centered or client-centered learning. And each of those I'm going to try and explore as well. But I'm also going to, to um, have a look at some neo-Marxist theories to see what we can learn from those as well. So, so I'm going to throw a lot of ideas at you. And hopefully um, you'll, you'll think about how we can reduce the psychological gap and how we can promote the sense of community within our learners as they study online and at a distance, albeit face to face. So social presence. I guess this comes from the work of short Christian Williams from back in 1976. Um, the idea that there are lots of aspects to this. But in effect, what we're trying to do here is to create a presence whereby we feel we're together even when we're separated by geographical distance. 
Um, so to overcome the psychological distance is one thing. To overcome the geographical distance is another. Geographical distance is quite easy to overcome. The psychological distance is harder. That's the premise. And here's another idea which um, you need to think about as well. So all of these components together are thought to provide what we would call social presence within an online community of learning. And when we talk about immediacy, here's some other ideas for you. This is the Trident model from David Winter, where he talks about um, the three components of immediacy. But ultimately, this is all about trying to respond to students quickly and in a timely manner. And I discovered from many years of working online with, with um, uh, tutoring for, for, for um, both postgrads and undergrads, that um, the quicker you respond, the more the student feels that they're, they're connected with you, the more that the student feels they're connected um, immediately with, with the context of what they're learning about. So um, I made it a rule that I would try to respond to my students within 24 hours, if not er earlier. In fact, on most occasions, I would respond within the hour. Because if they were asking me a question, then generally speaking, they wanted some kind of support. They were in some kind of trouble. Uh, I, think, I think it was Patricia Carnwell back in um, 2000, and that talked about the three types of support that students need. <clears throat> there's the academic support, there's the social support, and then there's the technical support. And I, I found that the technical support and the emotional support are often supplied by the students themselves. It's the academic support that they really have a, a problem with and uh, need help with. And that's where you and I as tutors come in. Uh, so immediacy and social presence are really important components. And when we talk about this third aspect, the interactive aspect, the, the idea of, um, what, I suppose, where student autonomy could, could arise from and also a sense of belonging. The learner and the teacher is one type of interaction, but the learner and the content, I think, is equally important. And the teacher is not always there, remember. The teacher is often there in a token effect, really, um, through, through, the, through the content. Um, and also through learners, those, those are the three aspects, I think, that more identified way back in uh, 1992 in the American Journal of Distance Education. But there's a fourth type of interaction, which was later identified by people like um, uh, Leslie Muller, in fact, and also Mark Wood and Johnson, who talked about the device interface, <clears throat> which I think is really interesting because increasingly we're doing this. We're increasingly interfacing with, with, with screens and, and, and with um, the content through those devices. And I think that bears a lot more kind of um, thought about what is that interaction? And there is research being done on this. It has been since 94, but um, I still think we're a long way from understanding exactly what we do when we interact with our space, with that space, that peri kind of uh, personal space between us and our device, which is quite fascinating to me as a psychologist. I'm going to move on quickly because I've been creating content during this crisis. I, I, I thought, what can I do? I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor. What can I do to help uh, my, my, my teaching colleagues? And so I decided to create a whole load of resources um, <clears throat> through the Zill Learn platform, which is completely free. Loads of other people are doing the same thing. And what we've done with those is we've, we've created these standalone, um, very quick micro-learning courses, which people can do in under an hour and come away with new information and new skills and new knowledge about how they can support learners online, how they can um, identify digital literacies, how they can um, you know, see the significance of things like digital identity and so on within these online communities. And that's just a, a quick kind of heads up to you about some of the stuff that's out there that's free and available for people to support them during this time. But let's go off to, to um, this Father Christmas-like character here who's got a bit of a Napoleon complex, I think, as well. He's got his hand inside his jacket there, posing for the camera. And um, Marxist theory I, I used to turn me off, but then I got into it and I thought, actually, there's some interesting ideas in here, especially the neo-Marxist ideas, you know, things like the dialectical view of how we transform social aspects of life, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the dialectical process, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. The idea of how we overcome inequality, that the idea of how we can um, gain um, production of the means of knowledge um, production itself, uh, gain control over the means of uh, production of knowledge. And the idea also that reality is actually constructed. If you look at Marx, Marxist, um, you know, the historical materialism theory, you've got 
knowledge and reality being constructed by people. And I think that's also fascinating. And maybe these ideas can inform us a bit more about how we create better communities of practice. So let's explore a few. Come with me and we'll um, bear with me and we'll try and look at some of these. So the first one, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, German realist philosopher who, who influenced Marx's theory, talked about this idea of, uh, of a process whereby we have an idea and it's challenged by an opposing idea. I'm sure you're familiar with this idea, but let me, let me expand on it for you. The thesis and antithesis combined, the, the process of, of clarifying, discovering, expositing, you know, going through criticism, arguing and so on, the rhetoric behind that will lead to a synthesis of ideas, which uh, leads to another thesis, which can also be challenged and so on and so forth, all the way down through. And through a process of, of dialect, we gradually modify our ideas, our opinions, our beliefs, our judgments, our, and so on. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating idea because that could lead to a form of what we call triadic learning, the idea of the triangle effect, the thesis, antithesis, thesis, uh, synthesis. And I've used that for a variety of, uh, of um, online modules over the past few years in what I call uh, challenge-based or ill-structured problem-based learning. And I'll give you a, a quick example of that. I, I had a group of master's students who were studying at a distance with me, and instead of shoving content at them, which you can do anyway very easily in both face-to-face -face and online situations, and everyone um, tries to do that when they first start out with it, instead of just shoving content at them, I gave them um, some ideas to play with, and I set them a scenario which had certain elements present and certain elements missing. Then they had to solve a problem based around that scenario. Then once they'd solved the problem and come up with a solution, they had to share that solution and then defend their solutions against everyone else's solution. And it was interesting because I had primary, secondary and tertiary and also training people all in the same group together. And when you put four different sectors of education together in the same online space and you give them a problem to solve where elements are missing, ill-structured problems, then they come up with solutions and you can see the vast amount of different ideas that come together. And then they can argue why they have merits against someone else's um, solution. That was a very powerful mix of what I call the dialectical process. See, this idea that... Um, this idea that uh, you, you, can, you can look at other people's problems and, and solutions and learn from them, even though you haven't thought of it yourself. So that, that is one idea which I thought was quite powerful. So Hegelian dialectical, pro, dialectical process, this has um, a place, I think, in, in, in um, modern contemporary online learning. And another neo-Marxist theorist, um, guy called Louis Althusser, which I'm sure some of you may be familiar with, he came up with this idea of interpolation, which essentially is where, um, because of the, the culture that we're immersed within or because of the media that we're exposed to, we feel that we are becoming subject to the, to the ideology of it, especially when it calls us personally. And this is a picture of Lord Kitchener here from the First World War, the, the British uh, campaign to try and um, recruit as many people as possible to send them to battle, young men. Um, appealing to their sense of identity and it looks like he's looking straight at you and it looks like, like he's pointing straight at you as well <clears throat> this is a, a classic exam example of interpolation and I thought you know how can this be used also in uh, in online learning and so um, here's an interesting quote here have a quick read of it so we can use this in many different ways. <laughs> it's one that's very valid for today, of course. Um, but um, one of the things we need to do, I think, is to make students feel that they are being hailed personally, that, they are, that we're calling them by name almost. And there are lots of ways of doing this. When I introduced wikis uh, into education back in 2007, um, in, in my own uh, context, um, they'd been used for a couple of years. Ward Cunningham had created them back in about 2002. But the idea of the wiki was that it was an online collaborative space and uh, that it could be used 
um, to help groups to to formulate ideas together and share ideas and, and create shared documents and so on. We use Google Docs a lot now for the same purpose. But um, I guess the idea behind this was that uh, people felt lost when they were inside the wiki. And so the first task I gave them to do was to introduce themselves and to say something about themselves that nobody else knew and to create a space for themselves within which other people could come in and, and comment. And the second thing I got them to do was what I called gold digging, which is where they went off and found a, a, a piece of um, content or a source of material which they thought would be useful for the whole community and then bring it in and share it and say why they thought it was important. So this was a, almost like a form of interpolation, if you like, um, hailing students in, you know, directly and saying, look, this is you, this is your identity. How are you going to present yourself now? And then another kind of uh, Marxist theory, it comes from, in fact, Soviet uh, Russia. Back in the 1920s and 30s, Vygotsky was the counterpoint, if you like, to the, the Western idea of Piaget's uh, cognitive constructivism. And, and um, Vygotsky was, was charged by Stalin, so the story goes, to actually create his own theory of learning, which would involve um, a kind of a, a Marxist perspective on this, you know, the, the kind of community perspective. And he came up with the idea of social constructivism with three zones in it. And of course, the central zone here is the ZPD, as we call it, the zone of proximal development. And um, it's always been classically thought of that the zone of proximal development is actually always has to have a knowledgeable other person involved in it. Well, that's true to a certain extent, but I'm also putting it out that we can use digital forms of scaffolding, to use Bruno's term, the idea that now the teacher doesn't have to be present anymore, but the artifacts they've created, the artifacts that the expert creates can be, and then people can learn on their own in almost like a self-determined way, and they can be digitally scaffolded through those technologies. And um, th th there's, th th there's that as well, of course, and there's the idea of paragogy, which Cornelian Danoff came up with recently, the idea that, um, in fact, peer education is equally important in today's uh, digital economy it's, it, and ecology. It's equally important because everyone knows something, but no one knows everything. Even the teacher doesn't know everything. And so, therefore, everyone can teach everyone. And, and the, the differential, the power differential uh, in the ZPD can be equalized. So where the expert was up there and the, the novice was down here, you know, everyone is a novice together, everyone's an expert together, and we can all um, integrate our ideas together and can share our ideas together. And so from that, we came up with various um, theories around self-organized learning. I'm going to rush through some of these because some of these will be familiar to you. And the idea of self-organized learning environments, I know that Sagatra Mitra came up with the term originally but it can be used for other things beside students learning with a computer and a hole in the wall i'm sure he'd agree we would agree with that and, and uh, one of the first uses of this i saw in social media and there's probably earlier ones but one of the first ones i was involved with was purpose ed which was a hashtag that was created by a number of people including people like doug belshaw british scholar and um the idea of purpose ed was that you took the hashtag and you used it to write your own thesis, your own kind of thesis on, on what you thought was the purpose of education. Then you shared it through your blog or through a wiki or through a, an online space, and everyone debated this through social media. It was a superb project. It went on for months, and you saw multiple perspectives. Then um, uh, uh, myself and uh, somebody, an American uh, uh, colleague called Amy Berval, we came up with uh, various ideas. I, I came up with the idea of Twisted Pair, and we came up with Blimage as well, which is Blog Image, um, where um, we sent each other images and challenged each other to write about nothing but the image and what it meant to us in terms of education. What kind of thoughts did it evoke? And Amy and I started off together, and then others joined in. Twisted Pair was uh, a, a, another challenge where you took two um, completely disconnected people I don't know, like um, I don't know, people like um, Donald Trump and Mickey Mouse. That's a bad example, actually. But <laughs> but you know, two two disconnected people, and 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 you put them together and saw what that would mean in terms of the educational implications. And of course, we had incredible, incredibly creative um, blog posts and videos, and all sorts were made. This is one where I showed a picture that I'd taken as I was walking along the streets in New York, Manhattan, once. And I saw this bread thrown on the side of the road. It had all 
been stale. It was thrown out on the side of the road. And I took a picture of it and I sent it to Amy and said, write what you can from that. And she wrote a beautiful blog about it and then spent, sent that out. Somebody else followed with the Blimage um, hashtag. And before long, we had something like four or 500 blog posts from all over the world in something like 10 days. And um, each one of them was a very powerful representation of, of, of that person's educational philosophy, their idea behind what they thought learning meant in, the, in terms of that image. So it was quite a provocative, but also evocative and creative process. And it was all done in, in a sense through, through um, the paragogy idea, the, the pedagogy idea of, of teaching each other through those technologies. No teachers involved whatsoever, except ourselves, of course. And um, another kind of um, neo-Marxist perspective, and when uh, Gilles Deleuze was, was in fact a neo-Marxist um, theorist, and him and, uh, and Philip Guattari came up with the idea of, of um, right, uh, the rhizome in society. And of course, that was then taken up um, by other people, um, such as people like Dave Cormier, for instance, and, and myself and others, and talking about the nomadic nature of knowledge and, and, and identity, of course, and how you can roam around almost like in a, in a flannery way, in a flannery way, you've heard of flannerism, uh, wandering around through a digital terrain and, and discovering for yourself what is out there that interests you and going off into all sorts of rabbit holes and coming back out again and learning stuff that you never planned to learn. And, of course, rhizomatic learning, there's no hierarchy in it. There's no center to it. And it expands as it will. It, it, it's like a, an underground root structure that grows any which way it wants to. And it, in fact, it's a representation of both of our neuro, neuro, neuronal pathways, but also of the, the pathways that are created in hypertext and hypermedia on the web. So this is a, a classic now example of, of um, how we can learn in different ways and take chaos and bring meaning to it, bring order to it. Um, and from that, of course, came the idea of massive online open courses. I was involved in one of the first ones with Stephen Downs and George Siemens back at around about 2005, I think it was. We did, we did one of the first ones, and, and I came in remotely from Ireland at the time, and I had about 15 of my students in Ireland with me. We were visiting a university at the time, and Stephen was moderating from Canada, and there were other students around the place, all over the place. And we all learned together. And the idea behind that, the CMOOC at least, the Constructivist MOOC, was but it was an open, um, flexible, and, and uh, student-driven or learner-driven mechanism. Um, but the X MOOCs took over, and of course, it became very commercialized. And now it's nothing more than online learning in most cases, I think. That's my critique of it anyway. It's become too commercialized, and the, the owners of the means of production are now the big multi-companies. Um, but embedded MOOCs is quite interesting because you can take uh, existing MOOCs and embed them into traditional courses. There's a new type of blend that has emerged over recent years, I think. And um, I like this idea also that it's not content driven. Um, not the CMOOC anyway. The CMOOC is not content driven. It's driven by the students and their interests and how they share them with each other, how they interact. So interaction is becoming increasingly important, especially with content. Um, and obviously the, the idea, the theory behind this is connectivism. and um, I'm quoting Woodrow Wilson here. He was, um, that was when America had a president. And uh, it not, I not only use all the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. Interesting. So Karen Stevenson took this and she said, look, I store my, my knowledge of my friends. And I like the idea of that because for me, um, it's not so much what you know anymore as where you need to go when you need to know to find it. So we need to know so much, but we also need to connect now to a community of practice, as Wenger um, talks about, you know, the idea of connecting with people that know things that you don't know, and you can have a knowledge exchange as you need them. I'm coming up very uh, quickly to an end now, but there's three theories that I've, I've mentioned. I, I mentioned Hirtagogy as one, and Lisa's involved in this herself, along with Stuart Hayes and Kenyon and all the others. I've, I've had talks with Stuart and Lisa about this. And Hurtagogy, the, the idea of self-determined learning, I think is going to be increasingly important. There's a great book that's out on it, which Lisa co-edited, which is on my bookshelf behind me here. You can't see it, but it's up there, and I've thumbed through it a lot. So those three theories, I think, combined are, are going to be really important in the future. 
Um, crowdsourcing our learning, building a personal learning network. These are going to be important, more important than ever in this, in this time. And finally, um, the idea of the wisdom of the crowd. Um, it's not so much the, the, the individuals um, in the crowd. They get smarter because of the whole network, the amplification um, and, and the kind of the, the connections that are made. That's what makes the crowd get smarter. And uh, so with that, you know, that, that's just a few ideas for you to kind of get the, 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 your ideas going and to get, get some discussion going maybe. And um, I hope that's been useful to you. I hope you've found that, um, I don't know, illuminating or, or challenging in some way. And um, I think we'll, we'll stop there and maybe do some discussion, shall we, Lisa? Is that 30 minutes? Perfect, Steve. You were right, right in time. That was great. Um, we've got a number of questions in the chat box and also coming in uh, over YouTube. I'll start with this first one from Andrew Jacobs. Um, he asked a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, Uber is unprofitable and relies on private funding to remain afloat. Is profit now a reversed assumption? Um, so that's a question you might want to consider. The other is, what is the relationship between teacher and content? Is it more distance now with the technology moving at pace? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I, I'll, I'll owe you a drink for that one, perhaps, when we get back together again next in London or wherever. I'm, I'm glad you're there. Um, uh, Andrew comes from an L&D background, so obviously he's talking about <laughs> return on investment because that's what they all talk about in L&D, learning and development. And um, yeah, I, th I think Uber was an interesting experiment. I don't think it's over yet. Airbnb is more successful. I think that um, what, what we're doing really is, is, is working with disruptive elements. And I think some disruption works better than others. Some disruption is deeper than other disruption. Some disruption works off. Uh, we've, we've had discussions for a long time about this, Andrew and I. Um, and some some disruption is 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 is, is um, impossible to achieve. Um, it just becomes disruptive, destructive. And um, but I think from all disruption we can find some kind of positivity. And the question about um, the the information, sorry, the interaction between teacher and content, um, or learner and content, really is is, is the interaction because teacher and content um, I see as very similar things because the teacher creates the content in the traditional method. I think what we're seeing is a shift and it's been happening since the, um, the Read Write Web or the Web 2 began. Um, I think we can probably trace that back to about 2001 uh, when we began to see um, mm -hmm. the ability to, to write the web, the web as well as read from it and it became more participative. And I think that um, content is now being generated by learners just as much as it is by experts. We witnessed this in one of the largest rhizomatic structures in the world uh, called Wikipedia and uh, Wikimedia as well and various other um, uh, OER kind of um, uh, environments as well. We're seeing a lot of um, content that, that is being repurposed and, and, and revisited, uh, combined and synthesized. And I think it's an exciting time. In fact, I was even involved in a project on this uh, uh, a European funded project way back about 10 years ago, looking at the benefits of user-generated content in higher education. And um, that, that was a fun project to be involved in because we discovered an awful lot about the, the usage and the, the challenges of user-generated content. So I think the learner and the content is going to be much more important as an interaction in the future. Okay, now we've got a couple of questions uh, related to devices. Uh, one of them comes from Pan Pankaj Khanna, and I apologize if I don't pronounce that correctly, uh, where uh, the question is, presently students are confused with too many devices, Zoom, Adobe Connect, Google Meet. One lecture is on one device and another is on another device. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the solution for this confusion? And then a related question from Adia Dube. Um, while the learner's at the center, what's the interaction of teacher, device, and content? So maybe you could speak to that relationship and, and how can we ease into that relationship or, or alleviate the stressors? Well, I, I, I think it's an interesting question because um, often teachers 
like me and like you and, and, and people of, of, I suppose, older generations who have been teaching for a long time, we worry about how our students are going to cope with the technology. And I know that there are kind of ideas around that we have digital natives and so on. I, I don't subscribe to that idea. But I, what I do subscribe to is the idea that younger students choose their devices themselves. We don't choose them for them. They choose them themselves, and they have a vested interest in becoming familiar with those technologies. In fact, they become intimately familiar with them, and they use them without thinking. They become an extension, mm -hmm. if you like, of the human body. They become an extension of their memory. They become a, a kind of a, a way to amplify their, their skills and their, their knowledge. And um, I think we worry too much about how students are going to cope with the technology. What we should be more concerned about is creating environments within which those technologies can be used to to um, to to expose the knowledge and to motivate them to gain more knowledge and and to I suppose to prompt them to connect with that knowledge in different ways. So so I, I don't think we ought, we ought to worry so much about them being confused. Um, what we should be worried about is getting them to interact and, and to persist in that, that interaction and, and engagement. Okay. Um, this question is also coming through on Zoom, and it's from Dravonod Kumar Yadav, and who's asking, how can we minimize the problem of impersonalization in virtual education? Yeah, one size fits all, doesn't it? Which is a lie, always has been. Um, it's a lie that the education system has had perpetuated upon it for years, um, mainly because of um, the need from from governments to 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 push content um, and and to and to assess to the nth degree, so that everyone's tested to know whether they've learnt something or not, whether the, the money the government's putting into it, you know, I sound like an old Marxist, don't I? But, but the, the, the idea behind this, I, I think, is that we've got to move away from, um, from this thing about, you know, content, content, content. We, we, we've got to, um, I, I think, push the idea that one size does not fit all. We've got to win hearts and minds on this and say, look, you know, everyone's different. Um, we, we, we talk in, in schools about differentiation. We've got 30 children in the class. They're all different. Some of them have special needs. Some of them are brighter than others. Um, how can we differentiate? So you have to write something like five or six lesson plans, don't you? Or a lesson plan with five or six variations in it, with five or six different types of resources. Well, actually, what we should be doing is 30 different types of resources, but that's in, in, impractical. It's difficult to do. So how do we get over this problem? But, but there are no easy solutions, but what we do have to do is allow children to create their own, and students of all types and all ages, to create their own pathways, to create their own desire lines, if you like, and to personalize their learning. And the only way you're going to do that is by using more and more personal devices mm. so that um, the curriculum remains, but within that there's an incredible amount of variation, flexibility, agility, so that... Um, you know, everyone can play their own furrow and, and, and go in their own direction without being penalised. And that is a new mindset. That, that's a reverse assumption. That's what I meant when I, when I started off with, you know, education should not be about pushing knowledge anymore. It should be about other things. Okay, our next question is from Sandy Barker, uh, who asks, should we worry about the students that do not want to be involved in the class or in the community and are passive learners, or I think what Michael Bowden called witness learners? Yeah, I, this is an interesting one because um, I, we call them lurkers as well, don't we, in, in some um, online environments. They lurk in the background. You think, why aren't they getting involved? And there's two ways to look at it. Either you can panic and say, oh, they're not, they're not learning anything. Um, and they're not being involved, they're not engaging, they're not participating. Or you can look at it from Laban Wenger's perspective and say, look, they are legitimate peripheral participants. They're, they're, they're sitting around the edge, uh, but they're gradually going to be drawn in. Now, the trick there is to actually draw them in gradually, to give them incentive to come into the core and re not remain on the peripheral forever. I think it is legitimate. I agree with Laban Wenger. There's a legitimate idea behind peripheral participation, but we can actually move closer as people become more engaged. And the only way you're going to get people engaged is to give them, I suppose, a personal incentive. Back to the last question, really. 
and the personal incentive will involve us interpolating them and hailing them and saying, look, you can do this. You can be a part of this. Um, or um, the way I used to do it with my face-to-face -face students was say to them, um, look, um, what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to speak for a little while. I'm going to show you some slides or a video. And at the end of it, I'm going to come to one of you in the room and you're going to ask me a pertinent question and you won't know who I'm going to come to. So in effect, it's almost like a, a compelling version of, of participation where they're almost forced to be there, but um, to, to actually to listen hard and, and to have a question ready. Uh, and it does actively engage people a lot more. But there's lots of ways of doing it. I'm sure you can think of other possibilities. Okay. Uh, another question from Romina Katia. Um, and this question is a major challenge at the moment, especially for teachers. And I know we've experienced this as well. Also translated to students keeping up with the curriculum. This limits the possibility of allowing students to learn on their own and to find their own path of learning. Uh, this period could be a window of opportunity in personalized learning and in finding and in, in, in helping students find their own pathway. How do we create a balance? We need to we need to be operating at the level of government. Really, um, I think that's the only solution. It's a top down approach. To this there's only so much grassroots stuff that can go on before um, you, you you hit a brick wall, and then the rhizomatic route stops, doesn't it? Um, you can't go any farther. So we need to be um, representing ourselves at government level or at least Department of Education level to say, look, this cannot go on. Here's an opportunity now. This crisis has created huge destruction, huge grief and, and horror across the world. Let's try and take an opportunity here to take this disruptive aspect of, of, of our lives and turn it into something creative to stop doing things the way we've always done them. They say the first sign of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Um, go back to Peter Drucker's um, comment earlier on that I, I, I quoted for, for you. The idea that the turbulence is not the problem, it's how we respond to it mm. that's the problem. And if we keep responding in the same way, stuffing our curriculum with stuff that you know is there just in case, rather than having the just, for, just in time and just for me and just enough type of curriculum, then we are going to go back to the same problems we've had before, and, and it's time for a change. This is uh, another question that I think is related to the what you the question that you just had. Uh, what do you think, or how do you think, the post coronavirus will change our attitude with risk management in education? And do you think we're ready for new paradigms? Um, and uh, can we overcome old old dogmas in education? Mm. This is Coke, by the way. <laughs> it's Coke Zero. It's Coke Zero. So I'm, I'm mitigating the risk. Um, that's the problem, you see. We, 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 there's always a risk in education, just like every other profession. There's always a risk. You cannot minimise the risk. Um, somebody could come in and and and, um, and beat me up in the classroom. It's never happened, um, but it could happen. Um, we hear of shootings in in in, in classrooms in, in various parts of the world, mainly America, but recently other parts of the world as well. And, and these are horrific things. You know, how are we going to mitigate against something that's invisible, or, you know, an invisible virus? Well, we can't, but we can. There, there, are, there are certain ways that we can do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm in, a, in the at-risk category. I, I've been locked down for, what is it now, um, 53 days. 53 days inside. I've been out four times. Um, with my wife to get shopping uh, for food, and that's it in that time. And I, I, you know, I, I have an underlying health condition, and, and I said to my colleagues um, at my, the university I teach at now, um, "How are we going to manage this when the students come back in September?" Um, and they said, "Well, the only way we're going to be able to do this is technically because there's several of us who have underlying health risks, and we, and we cannot afford to." until you know there, there's a vaccine or until we, we manage to, to solve this problem with with a cocktail of drugs medicines that will um, stop us from from dying in huge numbers there's no way that we're going to be able to go back to to a face-to-face -face situation so it's going to have to be face to face at a distance for many people in the future i think that's the only way at the moment that we're going to be able to um, minimize the risk and and to and to keep the learning going learning doesn't stop mm. Even in wartime, learning doesn't stop. But um, 
what we've got to do is 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 um, create new pedagogies that actually produce exactly the same or better outcomes than we've got at the moment. And like I said before, this is a huge opportunity to 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 make the, the sea change. Okay, the next question is from Dr. P. V. Radhika. Um, how do we enhance meaningful interaction in MOOCs and how can we how can they supplement instructors teaching? It's the same as how can we um, create meaningful interaction in a face-to-face -face traditional teaching environment. You make sure it's interesting. You, you, you have to motivate the students to, um, to achieve, but you also have to collect their, you know, connect with their interest. And um, somebody asked me yesterday, what are the three key characteristics of a great teacher? And I said, well, knowledge, empathy, and passion. If you haven't got passion for your subject, why are you teaching? Mm. Um, Empathy and knowledge are important, but passion is, is, I think, the top of the pyramid. You know, without that passion, why are you there? And, and I think we've got to be passionate educators. We've got to um, constantly think creatively and think outside the box, think about new ways of engaging students, like some of the ways I showed you. Um, the, the evaluations from the students on those courses that I produced were, were tremendous. Um, and... You know, they, they were the outcomes were incredible, and uh, people were saying, "How are you doing this?" Basically, all I was doing was providing them with challenges, which interested them. And I was giving them the personalised routes through to actually creating their own solutions to problems, which they were then able to um, argue about and defend in an online shared environment. And that was all they needed. They had to go off then and, and take pride in what they were doing, and go off and grab the knowledge from wherever they they, they wanted to find it to actually marshal their arguments and create the best possible solution. So that ill-structured problem-based solving um, learning was, was, um, was, was a very powerful method. That, that's one way of doing it. There are loads of other ways of engaging students at various levels. Um, this question is from Ruizan Mekvabitsa. <laughs> I'm really getting in my practice here, just pronouncing names in different languages. Um, and it's related to what you just said, but it's more along the lines of, you know, what kinds of platforms are, are the best to use for, for, you know, creating these kinds of communities in an online environment? One of the things that you mentioned um, is the technical and emotional support um, that students can provide each other. For example, you use the example of par pedagogy uh, and that we should be as instructors providing academic supports. How can we use different platforms for different purposes to, to realize those communities? Well, there's the key, what you've just said there. How can we use different platforms for different purposes? It's about different contexts. So, uh, for instance, I, I, in the past, I've used wikis to actually get people to work together when they're, when they're separated. Um, to create um, online, um, I suppose, shared spaces for them to, to collaborate with. I've used um, other platforms like VLEs or M LMSs to actually get people to, um, to work together on problems um, and to submit their work and so on. Um, I've used shared blogs. Um, I, ha I had a research group. Um, I had a, a, a group of students who were doing a research project they were all having to produce their own um, research study, but they had common problems. Like, you know, how do you understand methodology? Well, you know, what does epistemology mean and how is it different to ontology? All these big questions. And um, I, I, I created a shared blog on which they would once a week write a progress report and then comment on each other's progress reports and offer support. And that had a, a number of, um, of different purposes. One, one was so that they could... Um, constantly keep themselves motivated to write and to and to study. Another purpose was to actually show their progress to me and to each other. And a third was to actually provide support for each other. Fourthly, I could monitor what they were doing and say, okay, intervene when I need to. But normally I would just step back out of the way and let them discuss for themselves what they what they needed to do. And they they gained ownership of their learning over that a lot more than if I imposed upon them something else. And um, my current students, uh, they create WhatsApp um, spaces. And they always do two. They do one for me and one for themselves, one with me present and one with me not present, so they can have a moan about me if they want to. And uh, I think, again, that gives them ownership. So in the end, I think you'll find that students will set up their own Facebook pages, WhatsApp groups, um, and, and so on, to actually um, support themselves. 
I think you don't make the assumption that's going to happen, but often it does. Okay. There's a question from YouTube from Francesca Niavila. Um, should we pay more attention to engagement to lay the path to acquire skills uh, rather than worry about uh, content? That's a, that's a really tough question because I think content and the, the actual idea of knowledge itself and, co and skills both can derive from content. So you, you can separate them out or you can combine them. Um, so knowledge and skills, two different things, but they have a common baseline there. And you try and separate the two out and they'll fall over. So I, I think both are important, but um, I think you mentioned engagement as, as the route through to skills development. It probably is because you need to engage with ideas, you need to engage with devices, with technology, with content, with people to actually learn things which you wouldn't learn through just flat content, as I call it. Um, so I think it's a fine balance that you have to achieve there. It's a form of blended, um, which you need to um, pursue, where you have a, a, a fine balance of, of, um, of content and activities, experiences, that together provide the student with what they need to go away and, and, and practice professionally. Um, I can't say any, it's much more complicated than that, it's much more complex, but it's about a balance between activities, content, and, and interaction between those. This question is a bit related to, to that, Steve. It's, um, is there a need for more uh, project-based learning in this age of advanced online learning and development? And that's from Pat. Always, always more <laughs> room for project-based learning. Always, because it, it, it for me, it's um, it's so wide-reaching. It's so far-reaching. When a student gets involved in a project, they have to think in so many different ways. Back um, in the day, back around about um, when was it? About 1985, 86. I was training nurses, and one of the things I devised for them to do, um, which seemed t totally unrelated to what they were learning at the time was to go out um, in a small group of maybe three or four students with a video camera and go and film a three minute video representing some aspect of their nursing experience. And so it, it, they would go out all day and they would record it and come back and then edit it. And then they'd present it that, that afternoon as the last session to the rest of the group. 30 students in the group, maybe, um, I don't know, about uh, seven groups, eight groups. And each of them had came up with a different video. And um, my colleagues were saying to me, you know, Steve, you know, what, what's the purpose of this? You know, what, you know, why are they doing a project based on video? They're nurses, not video technicians. And, you know, I had to defend that. And, and I, I did show them that actually there was something like 14 major skills that they would learn by going and doing that. And there was teamwork. There was negotiation of, 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 of meaning. There was technical aspects. There was um, decision making. There was problem solving. There was, and, and a whole range of these um, skills. And it turned out that every single one of them was applicable to nursing. And they went, wow, how did you think of that? I said, well, you, know, it's just, you need to stand back away from it a bit. And then look at it and think, what, what, what are we really trying to get these people to learn? Is it content? Yeah, but there's more to it than that. Okay, I'm going to ask you two more questions because we're coming close to the top of the hour. Um, the first question is kind of a mix of, of different questions that have been coming across uh, through the chat and through the question and answer. And that's along the lines of, you know, how do we within these communities address, address issues uh, where there's intercultural uh, issues that arise or ethical issues that, are, that could arise or language uh, issues. How do we create, um, I guess, a, a democracy within these communities when these kinds of issues arise? That's a huge question. And, um, yeah, I sorry. Anyone's got an answer to it. In fact, there's three different questions, aren't there, really? But um, I, I think the, the answer is that if the students own, they have ownership of the, the program they're studying, if they have, if they take pride in, in and, and um, they, they, they kind of appreciate the privilege that they're having by being there, because it's a privilege to learn with other people, isn't it, really? Let's face it. It's a human right, but it's also a privilege. We, 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 we want to belong. Uh, Maslow talks about belonging. You know, mm. uh, uh, you know, there's so many different ways of looking at belonging. 
and, and, and you know, it's a privilege to belong. It's a really important thing. So if they can take pride in that, then they, they will treat each other with, with, um, with empathy and with, with, um, with, with equity. Um, if they don't, then something's wrong. Uh, I, I think I've had only one or two occasions where I've had groups of students who have treated each other badly. Uh, and those have usually been because of underlying um, relationship problems that existed before they came in the classroom or before they came into the virtual space. And you, I think you have to kind of um, deal with that very sensitively. It could be a cultural thing. It could be a you know an ethnic thing. It could be a language thing. There are lots of ways that um, that transactional distance can be amplified. Um, and that's the whole point of understanding the idea of that psychological gap is that there are lots of ways that can that, that can cause that to happen, but there are also things that can cause it to reduce. And one of the most important ones, as Michael Moore says, is dialogue, constant dialogue, constantly talking. The minute you stop talking, you might as well give up. Yeah. Uh, the last question is a bit provocative, but that's from yeah. Al <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo Suero. And he oh, asked, really? yeah, could you explain why the Marxist theories in education did not succeed in the Soviet Union? <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, I, we know Alfredo, don't we, that it was suppressed. I mean, Vygotsky was suppressed in the West until probably about 76, 78. And then you started to see things like mind and society coming out. But um, I, I, th I think that um, I can't speak for the Soviet system because I don't know much about it. But I, but I know that. Um, Certain ideas, like you know, social constructivism, are, are rife in Western um, education simply because it's it's intuitive, and and we can see why it's important that we have social dimensions to learning. Um, I'm not sure why why it's failed in 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 the Soviet um, in the former Soviet countries. I don't know. I mean, Diana's um, in a former Soviet country, um, Soviet satellite state of Romania. Um, as it was, um, I don't know whether um, it works there or not. I, I think um, the, the, the answer to that, Alfredo, is that actually we're, we're all social beings, and you can never knock knock the social out of us. Um, you know, look, look at what we're doing now. We're all stuck in our own rooms, in our own houses, but we're still connecting with each other, and we're still learning from each other, and we're still being very, very social. We're still face to face, even though we're at a distance. Yes, we certainly have. Hasn't answered the question, I know, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to talk about that when I see you again, Alfreda. <laughs> okay, well, we're coming up to the end, Steve. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to be with us today and to share your thoughts about the different theories, the different approaches for creating communities uh, online. Uh, and uh, I would just like to maybe put up the slide for the... Um, uh, for the uh, conference that we have coming up in June, the uh, Eden Conference, the annual conference, which was planned for Tima Sawara in Romania. Unfortunately, uh, we will not be able to hold that face-to-face. -face. However, we will be having uh, an online conference. And so we encourage everyone to submit um, submit their papers and their proposals. The deadline has been extended until the end of May. Um, so if you uh, are working on a paper or have some ideas that you'd like to share uh, for the conference, please be sure to submit that. And you can find more information on the Eden page. Um, and I would also like to invite all of you to come and visit us uh, next week for our uh, webinar, the next one in this series, which is How to Manage the Onslaught of Information and Fake News. And our speakers will be Francesca Amanduni and Ir Ivan Katz. And the moderator will be Antonella Poch. And uh, until then, uh, I wish you all a very safe and, uh, and healthy time ahead. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate it.